Okay, great pleasure to have Dr. Richard Milton with us. He's the Professor of Biblical Worldview and Exegesis, if I got that right, at, uh, um, at Northwestern Seminary in New York. Northeastern, that's right. Yeah, the Northeastern Seminary in New York has been there for five years and we've been uh, getting to know him uh, both through his uh, tour of beauty with our sister college, St. Barbara's College in Adelaide, uh, the week before last, and um, uh, and just lately in our uh, event that we had here at Mark's postgraduate uh, event. And it's been lovely to hear uh, Richard's story about um, uh, what's brought him to the study of theology, to the study of biblical exegesis, and particularly for our topic tonight, the place of lament in the life of faith. I won't um, steal his thunder, but it's uh, certainly meant a lot to me that he's been willing to come and speak on this topic. I think we've probably all experienced those terrible moments in Christian communities where when things are going badly for us, we'll hear the worst possible kind of pieties around that, the worst possible, most emotionally incongruent, if I can put it like that, responses to to our to whatever suffering that we're in. And of course, this is not uh, at all in sync with uh, the deep aspects of the Christian tradition and deep aspects of Scripture. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass over to you. I might pray first, and then I'll, uh, I'll let Richard take over. Lord, thank you for gathering us this night we come to you with uh, those areas of suffering and sadness that you know so well both in our lives and in the lives of others next to us we do ask that you'll be using this time to retrain us what it is to uh, handle that differently uh, and to offer something different to others in the communities that we know we pray you'll be with richard as he unveils this to us in jesus name thank you richard about the difficulty of sound here. So I'm going to ask you that if at any point you can't hear me clearly, wave your hand. And I will start to slow down or pause more because I know that my accent is a little difficult for some people to hear. So my accent is Jamaican. I'm from Kingston, Jamaica. I immigrated to Canada as a 22-year-old and immigrated to America in the past decade or so. I'm privileged to be here with you this evening and to address a topic that I think is really crucial. I want to start by mentioning a movie. Hope that's okay. Um, this is a movie that my kids have watched six times back to back on a vacation. So I got really bored with it, but it's a very good movie. It's the movie The Princess Bride. You know that movie? It's based on a book. The book is actually even more interesting than the movie. There was a conversation in the movie when the princess, who has been kidnapped, says to her rescuer, you mock my pain. To which he responds, life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says different is selling something. Well, I'm not so sure I want to be quite as cynical as that, but pain or suffering is an indelible fact of human experience as we know it. We live in a world that is wracked by suffering. Many marriages, despite our best attempts, fall apart. Close friends die of suicide, or cancer, or heart disease. And we're confronted in our inner cities with hollow-eyed homeless people, rough sleepers, casting furtive glances in our direction in hopes of a handout. Meanwhile, the planet groans in the thrall of political violence and toxic waste. The victims of political violence pile up as dead bodies in city after city. Every decade the names seem to change of which cities are the most violent. But the violence doesn't stop. And as someone who is of Jewish heritage, my mother was Jewish, I wonder will there ever be peace between Israel and Palestine? We keep getting on the verge of peace treaties, but nothing ever really happens. And then we live in a world where we are, dis there is such destruction from hurricanes. A hurricane just passed by Jamaica yesterday, hit, hit Haiti, or as we call it down here, cyclones, or earthquakes with tsunamis that destroy thousands of lives, that the, the toll of human suffering is incalculable. The suffering of this world is massive, and it is multifaceted. 
Tragic as the suffering of our world is, this tragedy is compounded by the church's paralysis. As a people who are called by God to respond in compassion to the pain of others, we find, if we're honest, let's say if I am honest, that I don't have a lot of energy for the mission. Because we're much too focused, too spent, just coping with the ordinary crises of everyday life to give much of ourselves to other people in their need. So we pull back defensively, self-protectively, into a posture of uh, protection, avoiding the eye contact with people who are in need. Have you been there? I've been there. Because we are unable to bear the exposure to the world's wounds. I believe that the roots of our paralysis lie in the church's own pain that has never been adequately processed. The church has a very hard time dealing with pain. We prefer to accentuate the positive, but the positive praise and celebration is not always appropriate. So since I always get hot on the lights, I'm going to take off my jacket if that's okay. Can you imagine barely surviving a car crash? Perhaps you are the only survivor, and you're badly injured, you're in hospital in traction, and your pastor or priest comes to you and says, my name, yours will never do this, right? Just imagine, the priest opens the Bible to you in Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, all his creatures. Praise the Lord with clashing cymbals and trumpets and drums and let everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, your priest will never do that. Or imagine that you're in the middle of a tragic divorce, or you've just been downsized, and you don't know how you're going to pay the mortgage. And someone says to you, this was a friend of mine training for seminary who used to go around my church saying this to people in crisis. Just praise the Lord anyway, brother. Praise the Lord anyway, sister. But how can you praise God when you're suffering from the shock of disorientation? How could you if you were, for example, an Israelite in the 6th century, newly exiled to Babylon? How could you sing one of the songs of Zion, like Psalm 46? God is in the midst of Zion, she shall never be moved, except the city lies in ruins, and you're a thousand miles away. So like the psalmist in Psalm 137, you sing not a Zion song, but you sing a communal lament. By the rivers of Babylon, there we hung up our harps, we sat down and wept. How can we sing the Lord's song in an alien land? And anytime you are suffering, you are in an alien land. We're going to have a song that's going to be played for us in a moment, and it's on your handout, it's on the back of the, sec of the first page. It's a song called These Plastic Halos. It's a song by Mark Hurd, who died quite young. He was an alternative Christian musician in America. And this is a song about the typical protocols of church on Sunday morning. Let's take a moment and just meditate on these words.
I, you know, put aside the walk in the woods. Suppose I'm on the battlefield and um, my leg has been injured and begins to get infected and get gangrene. And you know what they'll do sometimes in the older days, they'll cut your leg off. Now that's not a good thing, but it's for the greater good of saving your life. So there are many things that initially may not be the best, but they serve a greater good. The greater good argument says every case of evil in the world serves some greater good, or God will not be justified. That's Augustine's argument. This comes out in popular theology. You go to funerals and you hear people say, well, God had a reason for taking her. That's the, that's the kind of way it comes out. Very inappropriate, I think, because it blocks us taking the disorientation of suffering seriously. The explanations for evil, just like a quick praise and celebration block us dealing with the reality of suffering. On the next page of your handout, the green page, and if you don't have a handout, raise your hand and somebody will find you and get you one. Anybody need a handout? Oh. We have lots of extra ones in the front. You could have set up here. <laughs> so make sure everybody can get one because there are lots of extras around. I'm going to read you um, an excerpt from C.S. Lewis in The Problem of Pain. It turns out that Lewis's book, The Problem of Pain, written about 1940 originally, was a version of the greater good argument. I'm going to start on the excerpt from page 81. And by the way, am I being heard clearly enough? Okay. I'm going to go down about uh, six lines on page 81 to the sentence that begins. We can rest contentedly in our sins and in our stupidities. And anyone who has watched gluttons shoveling down the most exquisite foods as if they did not know what they were eating will admit that we can ignore even pleasure. But pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. A bad man, happy, is a man without the least inkling that his actions do not answer, that they are not in accord with the laws of the universe. Go to page 83, about five lines down. Until the evil man finds evil unmistakably present in his existence in the form of pain, he is enclosed in illusion. Once pain has roused him, he knows that he is in some way or other up against the real universe. He either rebels with the possibility of a clearer issue and a deeper repentance at some later stage, or else makes some attempt at an adjustment which is pursued lead him to religion. So pain rouses you, it is a wake-up call, a megaphone to say something's wrong in your life. You have a choice. Either you rebel and say, well, to hell with you, God, or you turn to God in repentance. And notice he said the possibility is that if you rebel, you may turn later, but there's no guarantee about that. Let's go down about three quarters of the way down the page. No doubt pain, as God's megaphone, is a terrible instrument. It may lead to final and unrepentant rebellion. But it gives the only opportunity the bad man can have for amendment. It removes the veil. It plants the flag of truth within the fortress of a rebel soul. This is how the variant of the greater good argument goes for Lewis in this, this um, chapter, in this, in this book. Suffering or pain in this world has the function of the greater good of turning some people to God, who would never have turned to God without it. That's what justifies all the suffering in the world, that it allows some to turn to God. That's his basic argument, it's a core argument of the book. Now turn the page to the other side of the green, and there we have Lewis writing a little bit later under a pseudonym, N.W. Clark. He's writing this about 15 years later. I'm just going to read the paragraph at the top of the page. 
Meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you're happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing Him, so happy that you're tempted to feel His claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to Him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to Him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and the sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seems so once. And that seeming was as strong as this. What can this mean? And then he takes Psalm 46 and puts an ironic twist on it. Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent a help in time of trouble? What happened to C.S. Lewis? He fell in love later in life, got married. His wife had cancer. She had remission. Then he came back and she died in a very short period of time. So we're going to watch a video clip now from the movie on Lewis's life called Shadowlands. It's about a three minute clip, that's three scenes. The first scene is the, 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 the funeral and uh, Anthony Hopkins plays Lewis. I want you to just watch his body language when the priest tries to comfort him. And then Lewis will be talking to his brother. Lewis of course is known as Jack uh, by those who knew him. And then there's another scene where Lewis comes into the company of his academic peers. That's the most interesting of the three scenes. If you need more volume, just make some of the same thing. We therefore commit the body of thy son of joy to the elements, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I can't see her anymore. I can't remember her face. I expected a shock. So afraid. Never seen her again. I'm thinking that suffering is just suffering after all. No cause. No purpose. No pattern. I... I knew what to tell you, Jack. Experience warning. Experience is a broken teaching. But you learn. Why can't you learn? So I really do you think one of you this really good? No, we aren't in you. I haven't even seen it very good, please. What was that, Mr. Jack? The circumstances I have not seen it. I don't know that it must happen, it certainly does. But 
solid chain. Thank you, President. We're all good to get solid chain. Thank you, President. Anything I can do? Yes, uh, just don't let me talk for the best, that's all. Only God knows why these things have to happen. God knows, but does God care? Of course. We see so little here. We are not the creator. No. We're the creatures, aren't we? We're the rats in the cosmic laboratory. I've no doubt the experiment is for our own good, but uh, it still makes God the his actions, doesn't it? Dread. No! Won't do. This is bloody awful mess, and that's all there is to it. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if you could hear all of that as clearly as you should. Um, but what's interesting about C.S. Lewis, in, in the book The Grief Observed and in this movie clip, is what Lewis articulates is very similar to what many psalmists articulate in the lament or complaint or protest psalms. Um, it's also similar to what the book of Jeremiah articulates, the prophet Jeremiah, known as his confessions or actually his complaints and the prayers of Job in the book of Job. Lament Psalms, which make up over one-third of the Psalter, they're the largest single genre of psalm. The next genre will be the, psalm, the hymns of praise, that's less than a quarter, but about a fifty of the, of the psalms are laments. These are honest, abrasive prayers, which square, squarely face up to the dark side of human existence. So I think they can provide us guidance or a protocol use language from that psalm, about how to host or process disorientation. So I use the metaphor of hosting disorientation, because you know what it is to be a host. You invite someone into your house. So if you're not a host, you close the door and then keep out. If you try to keep suffering and disorientation out of your life by closing the door on it, it would sneak in through the back window. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. For, Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up, up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Singing the praises of the Lord, you, his faithful people, praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for your night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And now we get the full narrative in the past tense. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. O oh Lord, be my help. And you turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. So Psalm 30 is a psalm of new orientation. The psalmist has experienced a renewal. So I have this diagram which you probably can't see because it's dark but it's on the front page of your handout. I'm going to make reference to it along the way, and I may jot some things down on the, on the board, but don't worry if you can't read it so clearly. The point is pretty clear. This is a psalm of new orientation or renewal. The psalmist has encountered God in such a way that has brought about significant transformation in his life. So he praises God in the beginning of the psalm. I call to you, he said in verses 2 and 3, and you hear me. You brought me up from the grave, the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. What's well, another contradiction, right? Which was it? Did you bring me up or you spared me from going down? It's poetry. Get over it. Not meant to be logical. There are other ways to translate it to make it logical, but don't worry about that. The point is, the psalmist is bursting with thanksgiving and gratitude because God rescued him. He doesn't say from what. 
could be from sickness, it could be from war, persecution, or poverty. We don't know. But he says God protected him from enemies. But he doesn't expand on it. The Psalms are full of images like the grave, or Sheol, the pit, the miry clay, my enemies who are described as dogs or bulls that surround me. But rarely do they ever get more specific than that. It's as if the psalmist, and I think God working through these poems, wants the language to be so open and porous that we, whoever we are, can read our experiences through these psalms. A side point, you know, some of the psalms have superscriptions. This is the prayer of David prayed when Saul did this and so on. Take away the superscription. Is there anything in the psalm that refers to that? Nothing. That's just one possible example you can apply the psalm to you can apply to your own life too. They're very open bits of poetry. They're serviceable for our encounters with God. Now the story of a thanksgiving psalm usually has two parts. What went wrong in the psalmist's life, the disorientation, the crisis that ensued, which, and then they, how God intervened to bring about healing or deliverance, the new orientation or renewal. So a lament psalm is really half of a thanksgiving psalm as we'll soon see. So I'm going to go to the board and the far corner. A lament psalm is a psalm asking for help when you're in the pit. A thanksgiving psalm is a psalm prayed when you come up with it, you're standing on firm ground again. Does that make sense? That's why Thanksgiving Psalms tend to have the Psalms as a part of that, because I was in the pit. I called for help. You rescued me. Praise the Lord. Right? If you think about that, lament is even more common than 50 Psalms, because it's also stuck in Thanksgiving Psalms, though there are not a whole lot of Thanksgiving Psalms. So, Psalm 30 is slightly different from most Psalms of Thanksgiving, in that it does not just tell the story of disorientation and renewal, the crisis and the restoration, but it goes back before the disorientation to the prior orientation, which got dissed, is an American slang now. You diss somebody, you put it down, right? So this orientation um, fell apart, verses 6 and 7 of our psalm. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. O Lord, you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. Those are words of assurance and security and confidence. And we all need orientation. We all need a secure sense of place and direction in the world. Psalm 1 is a wisdom or Torah psalm, a psalm that instructs us in how we live. It is a classic example of an orientation psalm, which is probably why it's at the beginning of the Psalter. It opens the whole Psalter. It has a very simple message. Blessed are those who walk in the way of righteousness. They shall be secure and fruitful, like a tree planted by the waters. But the wicked and those who follow them are not so. They are unstable and transitory, like chaff the wind blows away. So nothing could be simpler. There are two moral directions in life. There are two paths in the covenant. You either follow one path, and are secure and blessed by God, where you follow the other and don't last. That's the basic orientation, if you will, of scripture. As a pastor friend of mine said, that's kids stuff, and he meant that positively. That's what you tell kids. You give them a moral framework. It's also what Christians need, especially when you're beginning the journey of faith. You have to understand, this is the way God's made up the world. There is a path that is right, you follow God's way, things go well, you follow the other way, and you injure yourself, you wound yourself, because it's not the grain of the universe, if you will. And you know it often does work that way. You work hard in school, and you might get good grades, and even a scholarship, and maybe a good job when you graduate. And you apply yourself on your job, and you often get a raise, which maybe a promotion, which of course you deserve. And you work hard as a relationship, and it turns into a marriage and you work hard at the marriage and it endures, and you put a lot of energy into your kids, and guess what, they turn out okay. And you work hard at the church, you're as faithful as you can be, and you have growth. 
numerical and spiritual and jesuism. Orientation works. Sometimes. And when it does, you feel on top of the world. But this sound of the world came crashing down. What he was his own metaphor, he came crashing down from the mountain top. Because his memory of God's favor in verses 6 and 7 is pervaded by a profound sense of loss. The psalmist tells of the withdrawal of God's presence and the disorienting fall from the heights into the abyss. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. That's what Louis experienced, knocking on the door, there's no answer. Where is God? The psalmist gives no details about the experience, just use the metaphor of God, hid his face. But it felt like God was gone. And it's really important to understand that the psalms of lament take experience seriously. Many Christians think that theology ought to veto experience. But there's a Jewish scholar um, named Berman, Joshua Berman, who wrote an article in which he said, and I quote, the Jewish understanding of reality is that our experience is veridical, that is our experience gives us truth about the world. And I think that should be Christian too. So this psalmist, like many in the church, has experienced, emphasis on experience, the absence of God. And like many in the church, they are consumed by a sense of betrayal. There are many people who sit beside you on a Sunday morning, if you go to church, who have neither hope for the future, nor energy for mission. Now, some of the pain in the church is undoubtedly caused by large family or personal crises. But much of it is the result of the accumulated frustrations of a life which just doesn't turn out the way we expected it to. Our expectations don't match reality. And in the end, that is a large crisis. And what are we supposed to do when the orientation doesn't work the way it's supposed to? What was C.S. Lewis supposed to do? Just say it's all for the best, God has a greater good in mind. Psalm 39 is a lament psalm. I'm easing you into lament by looking at Thanksgiving first. But let's go to lament now. This is a psalm told from the bottom of the pit. So it's going to have a different tone. Almost every individual lament psalm in the Bible anticipate sometime in the psalm God's intervention and they end on a note of hope. There are only a couple that don't and Psalm 39 is one of those. Okay. Psalm 39 is particularly instructive to us because the psalmist talks about the story of how he came to lament and he had a hard time getting there. So since many in the church have a hard time lamenting, this is helpful for us. Take a look at verse 1. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So his first impulse was to silence, voicing his pain honestly in public, especially to God, would, would be inappropriate. So the psalmist decides to keep quiet about his suffering, and put a muzzle on his mouth, since the wicked are around. And he wanted a good testimony in the presence of evildoers. So he said, in effect, my pastor always told me that a truly spiritual person should speak only nice, edifying words. And presumably he does not want to display a lack of trust in God in the presence of the unbelievers. So he said, my lips are sealed, thank you, Jesus. But the longer he kept quiet, the more agitated he became. Take a look at verses 2 and 3. So I remain utterly silent, not even saying anything good, but my anguish increased, my heart grew hot within me, while I meditated the fire burn. Wow, what's going to happen, do you think? Like many people in the church, this writer bottles up his pain till it grows into a raging fire within, and he's about ready to explode. And then he says in, in verse 3, Finally, I spoke. I spoke with my tongue. But it doesn't all come out at once. That's what he says. Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You made my days a mere hand breath. 
the span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. Maybe he's not so sure what God can handle. So he tests the waters, musing in a general way about human mortality and asking a safe, disinterested question about how long he's got to live. People, and notice he said that people die. None of us last forever. Why don't you tell me how long I've got? And God doesn't strike him down. So he gets a little bolder. And from safe musings and disinterested inquiry, he moves on to an honest admission of need. Now, Lord, what do I look for? Not how long I'm going to live. That's not really the question. That was just a test. What do I really hope for? I hope for you. That's verse 7. And he pleads for deliverance. There are at least seven imperatives in this psalm. You haven't told God what to do. That's an imperative. It's a command. You know, close the door. That's an imperative. You told God what to do. Here's what he tells God to do. Save me. Don't make me the scorn of fools. Remove your scourge from me. Hear my prayer. Listen to my cry. Don't be deaf to my weeping. Look away from me. Now, there were times when I would go visit my pastor in his office at the church, and when I was relatively in a good place, I would go to the door and knock. Got a moment? Can we talk? But if I'm desperate, what do I do? Slam the door and I have to talk. Very different approach when you're desperate. Why couldn't the psalmist have started with this? What held him back? And in his newfound honesty, he tells God why in verse 9. I was silent, and I would not open my mouth, for you are the one who did it to me. I'm not supposed to say that. It's difficult to accuse God of doing wrong to you. But you know what? It's very common in the Bible. His perception was that his suffering came from God, it was God's fault. And he's understandably slow to voice that. Now, in Psalm 30, the psalmist faults God for abandonment. You hid your face from me. But notice the language in Psalm 39, in verse 10. Remove your scourge from me. What's a scourge? A whip. For I am overcome by the blow of your hand. The psalmist basically says, stop hitting me! I can't take it anymore! Pooh. You only say that to God if you're desperate. It's like saying to God, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Someone we know said that, quoting the opening lines of a prayer, Psalm 22. The psalmist is accusing God of violence against him and pleads for an end to the pain because he can't take it anymore. Now, I will admit that it's not theologically correct. To accuse God of doing evil. I wouldn't want to write a systematic theology textbook, God is evil. A few people have done that and it hasn't worked very well. The, the point is that this is not the kind of statement one makes as a general statement of truth. It is a statement one makes to God. Let me give an analogy. Um, I will go to my wife sometimes and say, Marcia, I don't like what you just did, that was wrong. Let's deal with that. I'm not going to go put in the paper, my wife did wrong to me. That's a different kind of speech now. I can address it directly to her. Or my kids can come to me, Dad, that was not fair. Now they go out and publish on Facebook, my dad is not fair. I'm not going to like that, okay? So it's not theologically correct to say God does evil, but it's quite appropriate to say to God, what you're doing doesn't seem right. Can you change? Well, that's what petition is. You're asking God to do something different than what God does ordinarily. You think God doesn't know what's good for you? Why do you have to ask God for anything? What's the point of supplication or intercession? You're telling God, change what you're doing, God, because you perceive that what God is doing is out of whack with the way God should be acting. Many Psalms make similar statements. I mentioned Psalm 22, which opens with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To Psalm 88, which I think is the most bereft of hope of 
all sorrows on the surface. It says, I have suffered your terrors and I am in despair. These psalms bombard us with voices with the ragged edges of life that articulate pain honestly to God. They are abrasive prayers and they complain about suffering and ask God for deliverance. Many psalms along with portions of the book of Jeremiah and Job are prayers in which life is experienced as so raw and so fickle that God, who is the source of life, is also experienced as fickle and untrustworthy. And then the suffering the supplicant takes that to God in prayer. That is actually a radical act of faith. It is very easy to turn away from God if, you're not, if you think God's not doing what's right. But to come to God and bring that to God. So I think we can learn from the honesty of the psalmists when the pain and disorientation are that great, we have only three options. We can bottle it up inside, nursing it until we self-destruct, we destroy ourselves, and we explode into violence and abuse against those nearby. I think that a great deal of spousal and child abuse is rooted in accumulated suffering, which has never been dealt with, but has been kept within, and when it bursts out, where does it go? Against the most vulnerable that's close by. And if we are doing violence to those near us who are vulnerable, we can't even perceive, much less begin to respond to the suffering that we're inflicting. Now, maybe bonding it up is not the Christian way. This is our way. We deny the pain. We maintain the theologically correct status quo and we sing hymns of praise in church and say in some traditions, see if you know this, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. You know how many churches I've heard that in? Most of Presbyterian. But then you have the more liturgical version, right? The glory of Patrick. No, I know the glory of Patrick is a beautiful statement. Uh, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and evermore shall be world without end. The point of the glory of Patrick is that God is to be praised throughout all time. But the way the syntax of those words are heard in the church is, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Nothing will ever change in life, world without end. So if you're suffering, that glory of Patrick can make you feel I'm stuck. Being a Jamaican, I like Bob Marley's version of One Love. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. One Love. That's more biblical. Creation and eschaton are unified. But the present is not permanent. What happens when we simply sing the hymns of praise when we are not feeling? Praise, when we are never given a chance to lament and articulate our suffering or disorientation, is that we become numb to our own pain, numb to God, and numb to the pain of those around us. Because if we don't address our own suffering, we will never begin to address the suffering of others. You can only love your neighbor as you love yourself. Or we can follow the lead of the psalmist. We can take our anger, our doubt, all the dismay and terror of life and put it at the feet of the Most High God. We can bring our pain to the throne of God and say, you're supposed to be faithful, but I don't see it. You're supposed to be good, but it doesn't look that way to me. The amazing thing is that that is not blasphemy. That is a redemptive holy act. Prayers of lament are radical acts of faith and hope because they refuse, even in the midst of suffering, to give up on God. Silence will not get us through the pain. Only speech addressed to God gets us through the pain. Speech which summons God into our suffering, 
who says to God as the writer of Psalm 30 did, Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me, O Lord, be my help. Or even as the writer of Psalm 39 did, in his impropriety, look away from me that I might rejoice again. He doesn't have to be theologically correct speech, but it's got to be good, honest speech. Now, if you haven't experienced life to be so raw and so painful, then you don't have to pray this kind of prayer. Hallelujah. But guess what? Most of us have. And even if we haven't experienced that yet, it'll come. The time will come. It's phenomenal that the, the scriptures provide a resource for us that we should know is there. The majority type of psalm articulates complaints to God and asks for redress. And when we have the audacity to lay our pain at God's feet, to summon the most high into our suffering, something remarkable happens. God comes and changes things. So I want to show that there is really only one out of here. This is the arrow from lament. Lament is the door to hope. The articulation of pain to God is the way to renewal and transformation. There is no other way. So, being an Old Testament scholar, I want to take us back to Exodus. Now, if you have watched movies like The Ten Commandments or The Prince of Egypt, you know the story of Exodus pretty well. Both those movies leave out something crucial in the biblical narrative of the Exodus. That's in chapter 2. Because we're told that when God delivered the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, the hinge between bondage and deliverance was the Israelites' primal scream of pain to God. Between centuries of accumulated suffering and God's intervention, we find this remarkable statement. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. And God heard their cry, their groaning, and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God looked at the Israelites and was concerned about them. I think this agonized cry of pain at the heart of the Exodus in chapter 2 which is cited by God to Moses in chapter 6 as the reason why he sends Moses. This cry of pain echoes resoundingly throughout the Psalms of lament. So lament is redemptive not simply because you cling to God in desperate faith. It's also redemptive because it's rooted in the very pattern of the biblical story. Lament is the hinge between bondage and deliverance. Or, as one person put it to me, it is the fulcrum between bondage and deliverance. What comes between bondage and deliverance? They cry out. According to Joel 2.32, a text quoted in Acts and by Paul in Romans, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I think that's the point. Calling on the name of God, calling out to God for help, is an articulation of need. No one can go through redemptive transformation without calling for help. Prayer is the fundamental form of calling for help, and lament prayer. But this is not just an Old Testament thing, as I intimated by mentioning um, Acts and Romans. We find the same thing in the New Testament. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he faces his time of disorientation, cries out in sorrow, according to Luke, sweating blood. Sweating blood is something that happens when blood vessels under the, the, the skin and the forehead and temple um, burst. And it happens when some people contemplate their own death. It's a phenomenon we do know, a medical phenomenon. Jesus, facing this time of disorientation, sweating blood, pleads with the Father, let this cup pass from me. And then on the cross, in the midst of his disorientation and agony, he cries out, quoting Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? 
And the disorientation of Jesus was so massive, says the New Testament, that when he died, there was an earthquake. Creation itself reeled in a kind of cosmic sympathy with the Son of God. And so Jesus was plunged into the abyss of disorientation, even death. He was crucified, dead, buried, says the Apostles Creed, descended into old translations say hell, Hades, death, the grave, the pit, Sheol, that's the pattern of the Psalms. But his cry, even of abandonment, went up to God, and three days after his disorientation and his agonized cry, God answered him and raised him from the dead. Those who read the New Testament without the old often don't realize that, that the, the move from cross to resurrection mirrors the move from bondage to deliverance in the Exodus story, and the, the hinge, the fulcrum, is the cry out to God, the lament. Lament is thus crucial. But more than this, the cross itself was God's response to the lament of all creation. For creation itself, says Paul in Romans 8, is groaning in its bondage where he got that phrase from? Exodus 2. And it is yearning eagerly for redemption while being subject to futility. And we ourselves, says Paul, groan inwardly with all creation. So my claim is that our articulation of groans into prayer, even ragged prayers on the boundaries of propriety, have the potential to unleash the power of the resurrection in our lives. Because what does the groaning of creation result in? Creation itself shall be set free. Now it would be great if we didn't have to go through disorientation. The fact is most of us do. And if we haven't gone through it yet, it will come very soon. And by the time most of us are the age we are here, most of us have been through some sort of disorientation. Um, it's also great if we only had to go through it once, wouldn't it be nice? But many times we go through multiple times of suffering. The Psalms provide us with models of how ordinary people before us have dealt with the ragged edges of life and moved on with integrity and hope to redemptive newness. In conclusion, I want to suggest that silence about pain in our society and in the church conveys the message that God doesn't care about suffering. Too many Christians think they have to suppress their pain to sing glib hymns of praise and thanksgiving, when what they really needed is closer to a primal scream of rage. And hurting visitors are effectively excluded from participation in worship by invocations which call the congregation to put aside problems and come and worship God. Soon after I discovered the Lament Psalms and we articulated a faith that was withering, that was dying, I started looking for a new church that had just moved. And I'd go into a church and I'd hear, let us put aside our problems and come and worship God. I just turned around and went back out and worshiped God in the park that day. But I finally found a church that actually said, the first time I went there, we're all going through difficulties. Let's bring all of our pain to the throne of grace because God has grace to give us. I actually started crying at that point and never left that church till I moved to a new city. In fact, that church at one point asked me to give quote my testimony in an evening service. And I said, at this point, my testimony is about being in the valley. It's got no positive end yet. You know what I was told by the pastor? That's fine if that's where you are. We need to hear that. I really stuck with this church. This is phenomenal. If the church took seriously the lament psalms as model modes of speech, as protocols of worship, in its communal life, not just in individual pastoral counseling, I know many pastors use the lament psalms, but in communal life, and if we process the pain of our members in public worship, what would that convey? It would convey the message the radical message that our suffering matters to God. Indeed, it matters so much that he bore our suffering in his body on the tree. Does it matter to us? 
For suffering matters to God, and we really believe that, we might begin to believe and to feel that the suffering of other people matters too. So voicing our pain to God might then be redemptive not just for ourselves, but ultimately for the world. As that which unleashes the power of resurrection, lament has the potential to generate genuine thanksgiving for the grace of God, thus energizing the church in its vocation in a suffering world. And I have, in many churches, done lament services, communal lament services, sometimes using Psalm 88, the most desperate of all the psalms, without focusing too much on the core positive, just having us express ourselves to God. And many people in those services in praise. It just comes out to think that the God of all creation would want to hear us be honest about what we're going through generates thanksgiving and gratitude more than singing hymns what the what the song does okay i think i'm going to stop there i don't know if